And welcome to the studio. You are listening to Small Biz Matters here on Triple H 100.1 FM with Alexi Boyd and live across the community radio network Australia. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. We are in the midst of a guest fest here on Small Biz and we've got loads of fantastic people. If you've been listening to the podcast in recent weeks, you'll know that we've um, we've had a few extra bonus guests, actually, because this is small thing happening which only affects a small number of people actually no it affects all of us and that is the state election coming up this saturday remember as always as a community organization if you haven't voted don't don't vote now vote on saturday go to your local school get your democracy sausage support your local community organization very very important but today i am super excited because uh for the beginning of the program today we have angela (laughs) i'm gonna say it wrong (laughs) vathulkas hooray i got it right uh in the studio now um a bit of a superstar a bit of a role model for me i've always um idolized her in the last few years because she has been running on eagle waves her own small business program and is a a staunch, staunch, passionate advocate for small business over and above anything else and um, lives it, eats it, breathes it, is a small business owner, is has a history of fo- small business ownership, a successful small business ownership, mind you, and stands up for the rights of small businesses. And that is why we are very proud to welcome her to the studio. Thank you for coming, Angela. I am very, very happy and privileged to be here. I'm very <laughs> excited because it's not often I get to sit on the other side. Indeed, on the other side of the panel. Um, look, today we're going to be talking about some of those really important election issues. They are the same issues that we have put to Matt Keen two weeks ago and to our Labor candidate here, Katie Gompertz. She spoke about these small business issues. And I'm going to put the same questions to you, to you as well. And they are centred around small business and the importance of small business in our economy. So, so let's get started. Regulation red tape, whatever you want to call it, the thing that we trip over as small businesses. It's a real hassle and it makes everyday uh, working within a small business very difficult. Can you tell me, um, you're of course going for the upper house seat. Correct. Um, So uh, that is how, that's in the the long piece of paper. That's on the, what they call affectionately the bedspread. The bedspread, the tablecloth uh, and that's, um, and and you need to, how many numbers is it above the line? Okay, so. Yeah, let's do this because it's really important that people get this right. Let's start with the technical stuff, okay. So I'm Angela Vithoulkas. I am the leader of the Small Business Party. We are a registered party here in New South Wales and federally. Um, When you get the very long piece of paper, the bedspread, there are 20 groups on this and they they group them. Every political party or group gets allocated an alphabetical letter. We're group R, so it goes up to there's two more after us, two or three more after us, and there is a line, a thick line, and you can vote above the line, so it's non-compulsory preferential voting in New South Wales. So you only have to vote in one box above the line if you're so inclined, or you can vote for more. And then below the line, if you choose to randomly select different candidates from different parties, you have to fill out 15 boxes below the line. And that can get a little bit complicated. It can also be a little bit scary because you can lose count of where you're going and that could make your vote invalid. That's right. And so how many numbers above the line only do you need one, to fill in? Only, only one. Only one is compulsory. Got so it. So it's a number. Don't tick a box. Please put a number. If you feel inclined to stand up for small business, there is only one party that is dedicated to small business. That's us. You can put one in that box. You can choose other parties after that or you can just leave it at one, fold up the paper, put it in the ballot box and say, see you later. And remember, if you've got any questions, of course, you've got the election representatives there yes. to support you and help you. And, and if you make a mistake, you can get another, get another piece of paper. Well. But you don't. have to hand the other one in. Don't throw it up. That's right. Bin. Yeah. Don't just, yeah. Otherwise, those poor buggers are going to be looking at the bin for the next three hours after the yes. end of the night. <laughs> they yes. have to and they don't, they don't like diving in those dumps. No. <laughs> so let's talk about um, regulation, as I yes. was saying, in relation to small business. Um, can you tell me about what you've, you would have planned over the next one to two years um, should you come into power in the upper house? So I've spent the last seven years in local government and compliance in local government, particularly in the City of Sydney, amongst all councils, because this is usually the first port of call for small business when they want to establish or get themselves registered uh, or if they need any help locally. And I know that compliance is absolutely so overwhelming. It can take some businesses 18 months to get set up. Now, if you've got a dream about being a small business owner of of any size, it doesn't matter, small, medium or large, even just as a startup, your life is already made impossible through compliance. So if it takes you 18 months to get set up because you're running around a maze like a little mouse in a maze experiment, trying to find out which door to open, which door to go through, which form to fill out because 
yes, there's always another form and it's not always online. So most of us will say, well, where can I find it online? How can I download it, fill it out, put it in? No, it is never that simple. The biggest problem there, Alexi, is because every government department, whether it's local, state or federal, operates as a silo. So there is no common thread. So because the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, often there's a massive disconnect. So if you take 18 months to get set up, then once you're in business and anyone that's out there already operating in a small business knows that you have compliance fatigue. So you are spending endless hours, day after day, week after week, year after year, trying to keep your head above compliance water. Then eventually the system is designed to beat you. And you obviously at some point make a decision to either exit a small business, whether it's from profitability issues, sales issues, or you're just sick and tired of the paperwork and you want to go back to being a well-paid employee because we're not all well-paid in small business and you, and you give up. So the system is designed to defeat you. There's good data now and stats that shows a small business owner can spend 14 hours a week on compliance, which is almost $58,000 of unpaid time just looking after compliance, not so working in their business. You mentioned it. these silos. Is that where you think one of the sticking points is, is that these lack of communication between the, t- between the silos and between the government departments? And if so, how can that be rectified after so many years of behaving that way? It, it is a cultural issue within government. It's a bureaucracy challenge and, it's an, and it is a nightmare. Then it needs to be streamlined and that is one of our top priorities if we are to be elected, which we look forward to and, and hope for, uh, is that we need to streamline the conditions, the steps and the advocacy for small business of when they want to start up and stay in business. Because we know small business employs 51% of the workforce. There are more than 736,000 of us just in New South Wales alone. And the failure rates are there for a reason. It's not just about money with us. It's more than that. We put our heart and soul into a business, but the system is geared to shutting us out, not opening up doors. So do you visualise a a dedicated small business department or something that carries across all of these different silos, as you put it? So what they need to do and and part of our advocacy and what we would fight for in the upper house is that every government department should have a mandate Mm -hmm. on prioritising small business so that within their policy, within their guidelines, within the way they execute things, within the way they consider new policy or new regulation, there has to be something in there that allows for small business to apply or to manoeuvre or to have some assistance because we are the last ones that they think of and we should be the first ones. Given that we employ such a big part of the workforce, given that we contribute so much to the economy, and let me be cliche, let me be cliche here, every major political party at election time says the same thing. Small business is the backbone of our nation and the engine room of the economy. Oh, don't say engine room. If I hear the word engine room, we're talking about small business again without actually being anything substantial. I know, it's vomit world. It's vomit world. (laughs) Let's talk about something that's quite close to your heart, which is infrastructure. Mm. Now, as um, many of our listeners would know, because we've we've spoken about you a number of times on the program, um, your your very successful business was a victim of what's going on in George Street, which continues to go on in George Street, which is laughable. Um, And, of course... You have the ability to, you know, regroup and and, re, and begin again, not to say that it wasn't a heartache, but you've been through that situation with a number of small businesses who have been there for generations on George Street, those small mama and papa businesses which are, are largely completely extinguished. Now, Gladys Berejiklian's government has said that she's going to continue to put together these focus groups to talk to small businesses, um, as Matt Keane had, the, had said a couple of weeks ago, at every stage of the process. Do you think that's working And what would you do to improve those groups? Or would you even continue with those groups because they're fundamentally clearly not working? I don't want there to be dead air uh, for your program and for the listeners, but that is one of the most ridiculous and outlandish statements I have ever heard from this Liberal government. Those focus groups, if in fact they do exist, often do not have people who have first-hand experience of what's happening. I spent two years trying to get the attention of state government on this light rail project through official channels, given that I was and am and a sitting elected member of the City of Sydney Council and had first-hand knowledge and sat on all of these group meetings and pointed out to them every step of the way how this was going to affect small business. They threw all of my concerns out the window. They said that it was only me that had any concern. These focus groups, not only are they slow, and I pity anyone on them because they won't be heard. 
they'll go through the motions like they have done for every other light rail meeting and every other infrastructure meeting, and that includes West Connects and every other Connects that's out there. They disregard the concerns. They feel that, and as I was told at all of these meetings, sure, some small businesses will close, but others will open after, so it's okay. It is never okay when a small business goes broke and closes because off the back of that closure, there are hundreds of other people who are affected by that ripple effect. There are families, there are local communities, there are suppliers, there are stakeholders, even the landlord, and many of us don't have a lot of empathy there, even the landlord is affected with every one of these closures. You don't need a focus group to tell you that infrastructure will affect a business if it's on that route. You don't need a focus group for that. What you need is action. And action means either mitigate or compensate. There is only two paths. Why do you need a focus group to say, if we build in front of your shop and customers can't come in, it will affect you? Really? We have very smart people in government, apparently, who are excessively well paid. There are studies after studies after studies. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's no or never has been an economic impact study on how it will affect local economies every time they do an infrastructure project. You know, they spent millions on a flora and fauna impact study for light rail. Not one dollar on an economic impact of small business. Not one dollar. And you would assume that moving forward with those infrastructure projects, that would be continuous? They wouldn't, they wouldn't be, you know, investing and, and putting that out there to find out? But I They haven't what- learnt one single lesson. They promised us when they went to the Newcastle light rail, because it's not just the Sydney CBD light rail. You are, and you're supporting those, those Newcastle businesses as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. We have a class action up there, up and running. They went to Newcastle. They said, they said, the Liberal government said at a Newcastle press conference, we have learnt our lessons from the Sydney light rail project. We will not rip up the entire route. We will do it in stages. We will help small businesses and we will mitigate against them. Nothing. They did nothing of the sort. They ripped up the entire route. They devastated that local economy because it doesn't have the hundreds of thousands of of foot traffic that the CBD has to at least try and scramble and survive. They absolutely annihilated them. People are still out of business down there and they learnt nothing. And now they're going to do the same to Parramatta. So what exactly are these focus groups showing? It's a good point. Thank you for highlighting that, Angela. Let's talk about something that else, uh, something else that you you are using as one of your policy um, drivers, which is payroll tax. Mm. Now, um, the same question was put to the other two candidates in the area, which is, what is the long term plan for the payroll tax? It's one of the major financial burdens of small business, and it seems a bit counterintuitive to be uh, penalising businesses who, through growth and through employing staff are having to pay extra tax. Now, the Liberal government has said that they are raising the threshold and it's increasing between 750000 up to $1 million over time and that will ease the burden on small and micro businesses. What's your response to that? So that's what the, um, the Liberal government has said and, that, and that's progress. That's going in the right way. Uh, the Labor government has said they'll wind it back. So we're sandwiched between two governments coming up. Hang on, so the Labor government has said that they're going to Reduce, reduce it. Yes, they don't want it to. They don't want to increase the threshold. They mm. want it to go back. Why does the government need this money? Because well, the government needs the money. The government needs money. Right. Yes, they absolutely do need money. Um, we have a lot of it in New South Wales government, and a lot of it is being wasted. And it's time for uh, the any government to understand that if you are going to waste taxpayers' money, then we need our money back in our pockets because we do a better job of it. Mm -hmm. And let's understand that I'm advocating for no payroll tax. The Small Business Party stands for no payroll tax because this is an additional burden on businesses. It doesn't make any sense as to why we should be penalised when we are employing more people who are better for the economy. If we want our businesses to thrive and grow, we need more people employed. More people employed means less welfare. More people employed means more investment locally. That money, that money from payroll tax would stay within the economy in the hands of very responsible people, small businesses and their employees. More money to spend in the economy means more GST for state government and it means everything will churn. But by taking that money out, it means small businesses will think twice before they grow, they'll think twice before they employ someone, they'll actually think twice before they go into business. Because that threshold, even if it reaches that one million, is not that big. When you are looking at employing people on an average salary of around a hundred thousand dollars, that's before any of the costs kicking. And payroll tax is calculated on superannuation. Why? 
why this is another cost that the employer is is bearing and happily we do that but why are we calculating payroll tax on superannuation it's not a wage it's part of a package but it's not the wage so i absolutely think our money is better off in our hands because government is wasting it they need to tighten their belts they need to be more responsible for the money that we give them because every dollar they spend is our money it doesn't come from a miracle pot out of the hole in the ground or a tree. It is our money we give them to caretake and run this state. They need to run it better. There is 44% of wastage within government. I know that firsthand. I've been in government for seven years. Trust me, every time they spend more time redesigning a letterhead, then they worry about small business. Let's talk about one final point today, which is all about innovation. It's something we're very passionate about here on the program and something we've been pushing for for our local member, which is some sort of an innovation or co-working or anything, any hub, something that we can work together in, in the outer suburbs of Sydney. So if you go to Sydney, there is dozens of co-working spaces, both privately and publicly owned. The one above Winion is completely supported by the Minister for Innovation's office and is totally free, but it's all based in the city. So given that the state government or anybody in government is trying to get us to work closer to home, is that something that you would support for the outer suburbs, the um, the money and the allocation of funds towards putting together hubs where people can work closer to home in a co-working space? Absolutely. not. The, the world doesn't stop and start um, just in Sydney CBD. It is bigger than that. New South Wales has so much talent uh, in that small business world with ideas and fixing, solving problems because that's what small business does. We're famous for that. That's how every big business started by solving a problem on a small local level. So we really need to be able to make sure, and we've got 20% unemployment rates for the youth Mm. outside of Sydney. So any of these hubs would address that as well. It's a great investment. The issue is, and the problem is, why state government falls down on that is because local members can only do what a big party suggests. What we're suggesting is that a lot of this money and funding should go back into local councils to be funneled through to local groups and chambers who know what's going on in their areas and their hubs. They can stand up for their local businesses, communities, and they can say, look, here in our area, outside of Sydney, as I said, the world doesn't stop and start in Sydney. Here's what we need. They know where the spaces are. They know what their local business hubs are. They can monitor and perform in those areas much better than any state government can allocate. The issue then is how can local government with their limited resources execute any of these programs? Every local government, every council in New South Wales should have a thriving economic and business development section within them. Most local councils don't, except for the bigger ones. They need to have a set area fully funded by state government so we can thrive in our local areas. That is the best way of funding this. Funding should come from state government. The resources and execution should come from local. And then the local chambers and organisations can then, from there, determine what should happen from that. It should stay in local hands. Well, that's uh, music to our ears because that's what we've been banging on about here on Small Biz Matters for the last five years. Thank you very much for coming on the program, Angela. How can people find out about you and make sure that they, um, if they're interested, vote for you on the upper house on the tablecloth? Just explain one more time. So you can go to our website, thesmallbusinessparty.com. You can call me directly and my number is on the website and I freely give it out, 0413 six one one three three four. I've had the same number for twenty years and I do answer my own phone. You can ask me any question about our policies um, and and where they fit within the small business community. Uh, when you do go to vote, remember it's the long bedspread, the very long ballot paper which is for the upper upper house, the legislative council. There are lots of parties on there. Consider your vote carefully because where the preferences go, here is the big question I get asked, who are we preferencing? absolutely no one. We are standing and falling alone. We are the small business party. We care about you. As you said, I have been a small business owner all my life. What's important to me is the future of small business. I didn't call it the Angela Vithulkas party. I called it the small business party because I want us to have a seat at the table. I can't bang this table, but I would. (laughs) We need to have a voice and we need someone there that cares for us so that every time they make and pardon my French, a dumbass decision that precludes us or destroys us, there is someone there to shake the cage that they all live in because they don't live in the real world in government and say, think of small business first, 
because we are the ones that are the heart and soul of the community and that's what matters the most. Well, that really wraps it up. Thank you so much for coming on the program today, Pleasure. Angela. It's been wonderful having you on. Now, Thank after you. the election, we would be very excited about coming you back on the program to have a full-length interview to talk about what the long-term plans are and a little bit about how people can be involved in the Small Business Party if they're interested in it as well. Thank you for your support. You've been listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. My name is Alexi Boyd with Small Biz Matters. We will be back after this.